Today we're going to be in Psalm 96. The special focus on verse 8, but we'll look at the whole of the psalm this morning. Psalm 96. And have you ever thought about what what is the purpose of music? Um, why do we have music? Why, why do we have music in song? Uh, does it matter? Uh, and, and as we look to it, right, music and song are creative outputs of, of humanity, right? This is something that we have designed and developed, and cultures from ancient times have sung and produced music. Maybe not the kind of music we think of today. Uh, it wasn't always rhythmic like we have it today uh, in kind of a mathematical uh, formula as we have it but every culture has had music and song and all as as it is true for all things in the created order music and song should be used to worship and praise our god uh, it is right and proper that we sing as we worship paul writes to the ephesian church in ephesians five nineteen. Ephesians 5.19, he tells the Ephesians, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. And indeed, as we consider the place of music in the context of the church, in the context of the people of God, one of the largest books of the Bible is a book of songs. So we turn to Psalm 96, and I want us to see today in our passage that the Lord alone is God and worthy of all praise from his creation. The Lord alone is God and worthy of all praise from his creation. So I will read for us Psalm 96. This is the word of the Lord. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declo- declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For all the gods of the peoples are... I'm sorry, I skipped verse 4. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns just the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. For he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. And this is the word of the Lord. So as we look to this, David is the author of this song. Although it is not, uh, if you look at the title of the psalm, right, it doesn't say that. But if you look in First Chronicles, you see that David uh, writes this psalm uh, or a version of it uh, for the purpose of thanksgiving. Uh, and he he writes and he 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 writes to say, right, sing to the Lord a new song. Uh, and why a new song? Because what David is writing about is something new that has happened. And in particular, the context to it is. Uh, the Ark of the Covenant has finally made its way into the city of Jerusalem. Uh, if you remember the story of David moving the Ark, it has a delayed moment uh, because uh, one of the uh, persons responsible for watching the Ark, for carrying the Ark, but they weren't carrying it, it was on a cart. As the ark, ox stumbled, the cart bumbled, and the ark was going to fall, a man reaches up to it to, to hold the ark back and is struck dead. And David is greatly feared by this, uh, this incident. And so he, he's like, oh, where's the nearby house? Let's just drop it there and, and just leave it there. But eventually David is moved in his heart 
again to bring the ark, and this time they do it in the prescribed manner. They carry it. And David, as, as this comes into the city, David writes this song, and he says, Sing to the Lord a new song. And as the psalmist here compiles it for us in Psalm 96, we are to sing to the Lord a new song. Something new has happened, and so a new song is fitting. We see this language again in the New Testament in the book of Revelation, where the, the people are told, the people of God are told, sing to the Lord a new song. Something new is happening. Something that has not happened before on the earth. God is pouring out his final wrath of judgment upon the earth. And the Lord Jesus is taking his rightful place as ruler of all his creation. And so to hear, right? And so we see in verse 2, Sing to the Lord, bless his name, tell of his salvation from day to day. Verse 2 tells us to tell of his salvation, speak, proclaim, preach about the salvation of God. Right? And again, as we consider this in the context of the ark coming into the city, this is what David felt, right? The salvation of God had come to his people. <coughs> and we know that the city of Jerusalem, where the ark is put, it's put into a tent at first, a tabernacle. But eventually it will be the place of the temple, the place where God's glory dwells among his people. The purpose of God and salvation had come to the city. And that same city is the city in which our Lord Jesus, the Son of God, Emmanuel, God with us, came into that city to effect salvation for his people. So it is fitting. Sing to the Lord a new song and tell of his salvation from day to day. He goes on and says, declare, declare his glory among the nations. Declare his glory among the nations. Uh, that's our goal. And why? We might ask, why is that our goal? Why should we do that? Because God deserves, he is worthy of glory being given to him in every corner of this earth. Understand that that should be the very fiber of our understanding of the purpose of God. Uh, John Piper once said, missions exist because worship doesn't. We have, we go into lands, distant lands, because we believe that the glory of God should be praised by every person on this earth. And the psalmist tells us some of these reasons why, right? Continuing on, look at, look at verse 4. For great is the Lord. Why, should he, why is he worthy of praise? Why should we declare his glory? Why should we want others to worship him? Because the Lord God is great. And greatly to be praised. He is, fear, he is to be feared above all gods. He is to be reverenced above all And notice here, even in these uh, the first three verses, we have lots of commands, right? The psalmist is telling us lots of things to do. Tells us to sing, 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 bless, tell, declare. These are affirmative commands to you, brothers and sisters in Christ. And let me just pause here and say uh, what the obvious is, or what the obvious question is. Sing, really? We're to sing? That's weird. Uh, you may not be motivated to sing. Singing may be the very last thing that you want to do. But if you are in Christ, you are called, commanded, and commended to sing. Now, I know this may not be the case for everybody, but generally speaking, when we're in a good mood, when we're happy, when something good has happened, what do we do? We sing. Right, we hum a little tune. Uh, we, we bop down the street humming a jaunty tune. Right, we sing. We make noise. This is what we do. It, 
And it's so much so, right? It's kind of a cliche. Even as I said that, right, walking down the street humming a tune, you probably thought in your mind of some movie or TV show scene in which this happens. And, you know, the, the, those uh, who write such things uh, sometimes take it and make it um, ridiculous, right? Uh, the, the main character has had a good day. Uh, things are going well. Uh, and then, you know, everything around them is like chaos and explosions, but they don't care. They're happy. And so they're just singing their song and everything else is going wrong around them and they don't care. They're happy. They're singing. Right. Or suddenly the, the lively music turns to sad music as they they step in something or uh, something happens that that turns their happiness into mourning right so again we've seen this it's kind of a cliche but this is what we do this is what is natural to us and remember what i started out with in paul's instructions to the ephesians addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody to the lord with your heart we of all the peoples of the earth if we are in christ jesus we have reason to sing We have reason to hum. We have reason to make melody to the Lord with our hearts. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in his marvelous works are just that marvelous, right? Two dimensions of this that I want to press into here as we consider uh, singing for you as a believer singing. If we don't want to sing, maybe we're missing something important. If we can find no reason to sing, we haven't spent enough time in the scriptures. And even if we must sing lament, our hearts ought still sing to God. It's remarkable, the book of Lamentations. Lamentations, and I want us to look at chapter 3. Verses 19 through 24, Lamentations 3, 19 through 24. And the book of Lamentations is remarkable because it's just that. It is a lament. And especially in our culture, in our day, we don't like lament. We don't like to think of mournful, sad times. And so we kind of just ignore it. And I'll give you evidence of that even. Is... Everything that is associated with death in our culture is kind of hidden away from us. It's pushed away. How do you get the steaks on your table that you like to eat? You know, we just think, well, we go to the grocery store and it's just there. Like, right, they have a magic steak dispenser in the back that they package it. If something has to die for you to get that steak. But even as we think of people, Where do we put our cemeteries? We hide them. We put them into the background, right? We push them out of our, we push them in the off-beaten paths. Now, granted, here uh, in in Kentucky, especially as we, uh, where I grew up in in a very, uh, uh, a, a more modern city, just because it was built in the last 50 years, 60 years, this was especially true. Cemeteries were out of the way, off the beaten path. You really had to go and look to find one. Same thing with funeral homes. Here's a little bit different because some of the older, especially the oldest cemeteries, right? They're out in the open. They're out in the middle. They're, you know, they're in the middle of downtown. They're next to the church. But understand that even in our culture, right? We push these things to the periphery. We don't want to talk about them. We don't want to think about them. We don't want to lament. But even if we cannot sing with joy, if life is harsh to us, we can sing lament. There is room for that for you as a Christian. Uh, Again, Lamentations 3, 19 through 24. Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. Right? So, This is not someone who has had a happy day. 
My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. Right? It consumes me. What has happened consumes me. It's all I can think about. And every time I think about it, I bowl over in pain. But this I call the mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Now, the author of the book of Lamentations, likely Jeremiah, has witnessed the destruction of his people the carrying off of the people into exile, the destruction of Jerusalem. And he mourns and he laments. This is the cry of the man who has been in the depths, and yet even in the middle of those depths, which interestingly, right, in the middle of the book of Lamentations, we have these words about the, the, the goodness of God, the steadfast love of the Lord, the, the ways in which the Lord is faithful. The Lord may rain down terrible wrath as judgment or discipline, but he is yet ever merciful. And so when we ask about singing, if we don't want to sing, then we've missed something important. Sometimes our singing needs to take the form of lament, but never let our lament neglect to mention the mercies and the steadfast love of the Lord. There is yet reason to sing. The second thing I want us to to press into as we consider this topic of singing is if we don't want to sing praise to God, but we're fine with singing secular songs, there is something wrong with our affections. You go in enough churches and you, you find that there are some people who never sing. But you view those same people in their settings as they're driving on their way to work, as they're uh, in their home. They do sing. They just sing what the world sings. And yet when they gather with the people of God, they do not want to sing with the people of God. There's something wrong with that. If you find songs about this world more palatable to your voice than songs about our great God, then what you are showing is your love for worthless idols that, that is greater than your love for God. And I'm not speaking hyperbolic here, right? And I'm not speaking as, I'm not exaggerating with this. It is a problem that needs to be addressed in your hearts if this is true for you. 1 John 2, 17 tells us, And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. 1 John 2, 17, This world is passing away. The things of this world, the things that are praised by the peoples of this world, are worthless idols that vanish, disappear, become as they are, nothing. In verse 5, it reads, For all the gods of the people are worthless idols. And what it is in the Hebrew there is all the Elohim of the peoples are Elohim. And don't count me on my Hebrew pronunciation there. But all the Elohim are Elohim. And, and what it means is that that last word there, worthless idols, it's literally things of not. Things that aren't. Vanity. Uh, disappearing things. Mere nothings. The peoples may call them gods. Elohim which is the name of God in the Old Testament, one of the names of God. (coughs) They may call them gods, but they are literally nothing. All the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. Why are we singing about worthless idols? Why do we give praise to things that are nothing. 
And the psalmist here says, but the Lord made the heavens. And this, the Lord made the heavens, is, that's just a, a placeholder for the Lord made everything. The Lord God made everything, but these are mere nothings. They sing about in the world things that pass away that are nothing, but we sing of our God who is eternal. We sing about our great God who is worthy of praise, for he is more awesome than all the gods, than all the substitutes of this earth. And the pages of Scripture are filled with ways in which God is glorious and mighty, splendor and strength. Right again, start with the first page of the, the very first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Look around you. Look outside. Look to the stars in the night. These are proofs of the might and wisdom of our God. So the verse verse 7, the psalmist says, Ascribe to the Lord or attribute to the Lord. Declare of the Lord what is true. Describe him as he is. He is glory and strength. Which now leads us to our verse of import. The verse that undergirds this ministry of this church. This is the verse that should motivate us at Redeeming Grace Fellowship. Verse 8. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Bring an offering and come into His courts. We give to the Lord the glory due His name. And what glory is due His name? Well, I thought of some ways, and these are not, uh, this is not exhaustive of a list, but here are some ways. This is how our Lord is glorious. He has created all things, and He did this with a word and from nothing. He just spoke, and it was. There was nothing but the Lord God, there was no matter anywhere. No energy anywhere. There was not time. And God spoke, and all was. He needs nothing. God is glorious. He needs nothing. He didn't need to create this world. He didn't need to create people to worship Him. He needs nothing. And we add nothing to him. And we can take nothing from him. He is whole and sufficient in and of himself. And he is glorious in that way. In him we live and breathe and have our being. Without God's work, we would cease to be. He didn't just create us, but by his power, he sustains us. You don't come apart in bits. Your atoms don't spread to the uttermost edge of this universe because the Lord God ordains and by his power provides that you won't. The Lord God gave us insight and understanding, wisdom and knowledge. We can know things because God gave us the mind to know things. He entrusted to us the management of this world. He gave unto Adam and Eve a charge. Subdue the earth. Be fruitful and multiply. This is glorious. Did God need us to manage this earth? Could he not manage it on his own? No, he certainly could have. But in his glorious grace... He gives to us the management of this world. God gave us creativity. Right? We have creativity. We, we can design and develop things. Again, think about music and song. How many variations of music are there? How many shades of song? People are still producing new content somehow. Although it's not always new content, right? Sometimes it's repackaged old content. But there's creativity. But even this, all of the greatest inventions of mankind, all of our might and glory, even to the most destructive, 
are pale comparisons to what God is in and of himself. God is glorious. Before the foundations of the world, he planned our redemption from sin. God is glorious. When Adam and Eve took bite of the fruit and so sinned against God's way, God was not surprised. His plan was already in motion. And as he promised to them that day when the curse was given unto man and woman, he also said, but there is coming one from your seed who will bruise the head of the serpent. God planned salvation for mankind before we knew we needed it and before we could even understand it. God is glorious because he has given to his people eternal life and the glories of heaven where sin will be no more and its effects never felt again. And again, there are so many, we could go to specifics, right? We could, we could start in the book of Genesis and see the specific ways in which God has gloriously shown his goodness. There's so much more we could say. There's so much more we could sing about. And so we are called ascribe to God, attribute to God glory because God is glory. He is glory and strength, might and majesty. He is beauty. He is love. The author of Hebrews in Hebrews 13, 15 tells us, Hebrews 13, 15, Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. And understand that 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 acknowledging his name, uh, that means acknowledging him as who he is, right? His name is his character. We acknowledge the truth of God and that should be continually on our lips. Here is the truth of God. Let us come into his courts. Let us come into the place where he resides and worship. Let us worship and rejo- rejoice at his presence and his coming. Right? The Lord reigns. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Why will it not be moved? Because the Lord established it. And it shall only move when he determines it should move. And he will judge the peoples with equity. <laughs> with righteousness, with true justice. There is no injustice in the hands of God. And then we get to verse 11. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the created order rejoice and be glad in the great and glorious God. And Calvin, in remarking on this verse, notes this. At the same time, Gladness and rejoicing denotes to us that God does not reign with terror or as a tyrant, but that his power is exercised sweetly and so as diffuse joy amongst his subjects. This is something very important for us to understand. Does God enforce his worship with terror, with utmost terrors? Or does he sweetly invite us into fellowship with him? There are terrors with the Lord God for sure. He is terrible in the old sense of that word. We use that in the sense of something bad. But it's in the sense of it fills with terror. He is, he is terrifying. But consider this. 1 John 4, 9 in 10, 1 John 4, 9 and 10. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, 
not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And this is reason to sing. Right? This is reason for us to praise our God. And understand, I, I, I say all this, and I want to go back to this issue of lament one more time. Because you may be walking in the shadows of darkness. You may be in a place of hardship and sorrow. Things in this world may not be well with you. But understand that God has created you for rejoicing. He has created you with this purpose and end, to enjoy him forever. And I don't say that to wipe away the reality of where you are. I understand that dark clouds do not uh, depart easily. They don't part easily. But understand this. If you are God's, you are God's. And his design for his people is pleasures forevermore. And that's not me saying that. That's the scripture saying that. Psalm 1611. Psalm 1611. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Trust that promise from God. Trust that he is using this moment for your good. Trust in him, beloved. But maybe you're in such a place that you doubt your very salvation. You doubt the nature of your salvation. And, and perhaps you can say, well, that's true for others, but that's not true for me. Understand this, that it is God who saves you. Your feelings do not save you or condemn you. God saves you. Titus 3, 4 through 7. Titus 3, 4 through 7. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness. So let me pause there and say, Right? It's not because of us that God saves us. It's not because we did good and God said, I want that on my team. He did not save us because of works done by us in righteousness, but how? But according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And let me just unpack that final verse seven there, right? So that being justified, that is made right before God. How? By our works of righteousness? No, by his grace. What is grace? Unearned, unmerited, favor, blessing. God says, I want to save you. And so you are. And he doesn't say, well, you're going to do X amount of good, and so I think you'd be a good choice. Oh, you're going to do X amount of bad, you're a bad choice. As Paul says in the book of Romans, before they had done either good or bad, God said, Jacob I love, and Esau I hated. And we have not time enough to unpack all of that, but all that to say, we are justified by his grace that we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. If you have any inkling of the grace of God towards you, hold fast to it. Pray to the Lord God and ask him to confirm the work of the Spirit in you. Say, Lord God, I'm struggling to know if I'm a believer or not. Would you please show me the truth? Pray for faith. Lord God, give me faith to believe all that you have said about me, that it is true. Say as that man, as he asked Jesus for the healing of his child, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And above all, trust in him. Don't trust in yourself. Don't follow your heart. Trust in the Lord God. Trust that he who called you is faithful. He will surely keep you and sing. This may be a strange thing to say, but sing. And listen 
Here's one dimension of corporate worship we often get wrong in the church. We don't sing for our own benefit. And we don't sing merely to glorify God. Understand that's, the, that's a major reason why we sing. We sing to glorify God. But we also sing for each other. We sing that we may hear the truth of the gospel from each other. Which, by the way, is why it's so important that we have good songs to sing. We sing for each other. So if you're in a place of lament, of of struggling, of doubt, listen when we sing. And hear the song of creation, which rejoice, it's rejoicing, right? The, The heavens are glad and the earth rejoice, the sea roars and all that fills it. The field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. I don't know that we often think of trees singing, and that might be a bit of a scary prospect for us if we you know, you're just walking through the forest and all of a sudden all the trees around you start screaming and shouting, right? But this is what creation does. Creation sings over its creator because the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. And there is coming a day in which all of creation will rejoice at the revealing of the sons of God because it knows that uh, its subjection to futility will be no more. Go to Romans 8 and read that. About the groaning and rejoicing of creation. God is going, coming and he will renew all things and put sin and Satan away forever. And as this chapter ends, we see this, right? We, the Lord is in motion. And w- where is he moving? He comes and he comes to judge the earth. There is coming a day when Christ Jesus will return and the book of life will be opened and all those whose names are not found written in it will be cast forever into that place of second death called hell. God is coming and will judge the earth and the only ones who will be able to stand are those whose names are in the book of life are those who have put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and his work. Christ Jesus came and lived the holy and perfect life you should have, but you never could. He died on the cross bearing the wrath of God, not for sins of his own, but for the sins of his people. He died and was buried in the grave. But this, but this is remarkable because he is not dead. And he is not buried. He rose from the grave, defeating the grave and making sin impotent of no power. He ascended to the right hand of the Father where he yet waits until his time to come again. That waiting, by the way, the scripture tells us is not a passive waiting. He's actively waiting. He's interceding on behalf of his people. He stands as great high priest beckoning us to come to the throne of grace and so find the grace and mercy we need in our time of need. He is not passive, but he is active and waiting until the time when he is told to come and to usher in the end of the age. Paul writes to the Colossian church about the work of Christ in this way in Colossians 1, 21 through 22. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. And this, friend, can be you. You can stand before God holy and blameless and above reproach. Not by works done by you in righteousness, not by your merit, not because you've earned it, but because of Christ Jesus. (laughs) And again, if you doubt me on your ability to earn God's grace, try it for a day. Set it in your mind one day that today I'm going to do only good. 
every thought and word and deed is going to be good. And then report back to me about how many minutes it took you to fail that. Notice I didn't say hours. I do mean minutes. You could never do it because the best of our attempts fall flat because sin, that, that evil that we think and say and do, is so ingrained within us. It's our nature. And it's what we always choose, save the interceding work of Christ. Jesus reconciles us to God. And when we trust in Him, when we believe in Him as our Savior and Lord, there is a change in us. Our sin is paid by Christ, and Christ's righteousness is made ours. So look to Christ Jesus. Turn from the worthless nothings of this world and believe in the truth about the only living God. And this, brothers and sisters, gives us reason to sing. Is not our God glorious? All the works of Jesus Christ, the works of the Spirit, the works of the Father give us reason all the more to sing and shout. The wonderful grace of Jesus gives us reason to sing. And so, brothers and sisters, don't neglect this command of God. Don't neglect to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to your brothers and sisters. They need it, and you need it. Let's pray. O great and glorious God, God, forgive us. Uh, Forgive us, Lord God, for failing to glorify your name as we ought. Forgive us, Lord God, for, for failing to worship you as we ought. Forgive us, Lord God, for failing to sing. And God, we pray indeed that our hearts would comprehend something of your glory this morning. That we might sing and worship in spirit and in truth. But Father God, protect us by your spirit to not see our times together as burdens, as things we must do grudgingly, as interruptions to our day. But, oh Lord God, help us to see them as they are. Sweet times of worship and praise. And Father, help us that our hearts may go, uh, that, that we may go from this place rejoicing. And this week we may have joy, the joy of your salvation. And Father, for those who don't know you, who have no reason to sing, Lord God, those who who hold to nothings, worthless idols, oh Father God, by your mercy and grace, send your spirit upon them, regenerate and renew them, that they might believe, they might have reason to sing a new song. God, we praise in us, we pray. In the name of Christ, our Lord. Amen.